My motivation was I didn't like some of the things that were going on. And uh, so my, the first office I ran for was the state legislature because I thought government in Idaho was growing too fast and uh, way too expensive and then became very intrusive. The bureaucracy has a tendency that if it's idle and not doing something, it wants to do stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, in fact, we still have that problem today. So I wasn't very successful, but uh, that was my motivation. I, I was I was unhappy with the way things were happening. And boy, if I was unhappy in 1972, I'm really unhappy with the way things are now. I'm angry about it, and that's why I hope our efforts, like at the Western Governors, uh, at civil discourse. Uh, I hope that changes things, because I'd like to die happy. Yeah, you know, for me, it was, um, I got appointed, so it's not something that I sought elective office right away. Um, I was appointed by the governor, and I had the opportunity to um, be in the mix of, at the legislature without actually to campaigning. To what office, David? Uh, State House of Representatives. Oh, I see. Yeah. I would, at the time, I was the youngest member of the House of Representatives. You were the baby of the house. Yeah, and the governor just talked about, you know, getting new people involved. He thought that young people were important, um, and and I was totally apolitical, um, and he made that appointment, and he asked whether I would run for office, and I said, I don't know. I don't know if I'd like this, but, um, but I'll give it a try, and I'll... All he asked was for an open mind, and he wanted the opportunity to talk about it at the end of the session. Um, and, uh, you know, I could see as an uh, electrical engineer, I brought a different perspective uh, to the process. I asked different questions. I, you know, seek different kinds of answers. Um, and I could see, you know, what motivated me to, to run for office after that first year was because I could see how you could make a difference, you know, in making your community better, um, being an elected official and and uh, being a voice for people who may or may not have had uh, opportunity to comment before. And like you like you said, you know, I, I thought that, you know, I didn't agree with everything was that was happening, and I thought that people needed to have a bigger voice in in what. Um, Hawaii was becoming. Yeah, well, I only stayed uh, two terms, and I became frustrated. Uh, I, I didn't like the idleness. Uh, I, I didn't like uh, the the fact that we weren't getting things done. And I came out of the corporate world, where an idea at lunch could be company policy at one o'clock. <laughs> No, I'm yes. serious. Yes, yeah. And in order to get anything done in the legislature, you know, they got so many days they're paid. Yeah. And they're going to use up every one of those days. And so if you got a good idea on day one, you probably won't see that come to fruition until day 60. Yeah. When yeah. the pay stops. And so uh, I just I just felt like I could do a better job. I didn't. <laughs> uh, I was a failure at that. And so I got out of politics for 10 years. And uh, then the opportunity to be lieutenant governor uh, came along, and we were in a recession in 1986, or beginning into a recession yeah. in 86. And so I, uh, I had been running around the world, 82 countries, uh, selling groceries and for the Simplot Company. Ah. And I thought, and, you know, putting together organizations. And I thought, you know, if I can do that for the few Simplot products, I could do that for all 44,000 products in the state of Idaho. I could be the best salesman Idaho ever saw, and we'll have our products all over the world. So that's why I got into the lieutenant governor's. Yeah. And I was successful there. And, and Governor Andrus, who was a Democrat, uh, Cecil and Andrus, uh, said in his first State of the State speech, he said, I recognize my lieutenant governor's uh, capabilities and talents, and I'm going to use them. 
and he put me in charge of all trade delegations, whether they were coming in or we were going over there. Oh, and so you don't run as a team. You, you governor and lieutenant governor are elected different, separately? You're, you're on your own. I had side saddle. Uh, on that you no, know, you're on your own. And uh, he was a, a Democrat. That doesn't happen, or hasn't happened uh, very often in Idaho. But I, I, in my political history, I've been richly blessed because that when I was reelected lieutenant governor, why the Constitution provides that the lieutenant governor is the president of the Senate. Ah. And it just happened that year, the 100th uh, anniversary of statehood, we were 100 years old, and I had a Senate that was 21 Republicans and 21 Democrats. Wow. And so they said, you know, they're loggerheads, nothing's ever going to happen. It was a pretty good session. And so, so what kept you going on? I mean, I, I, it was, it was um, the opportunity to make a difference, right? I mean, you know, it's in the private sector, you can do a lot for a company, but, you know, not so much for determining the direction of the state and, and really getting to the issues that you hear. I mean, even as a business person, you hear about the challenges of um, starting a business or doing business with the state. Um, I, I was motivated because clearly I, you know, I always believed in the citizens' legislature. I continue to work as an electrical engineer at the phone company. And I could see that as a legislator, I could make a huge impact. I can impact uh, education reform. You know, in Hawaii, public schools are run by the state, not the counties. Um, and I cared about education. Um, you know, I was an engineer. I wanted to help with economic diversification. Uh, and I could make a bigger impact as an elected official than I could as, you know, an engineer working at the phone company. Uh, and that's what kept me going. I mean, you know. I, it's all about balance and finding balance and, and trying to um, juggle the, the challenges of, uh, of, of being a husband and a father and a parent and, um, and being an elected official. Uh, but I, I did find that I could be a professional and I could be a public servant uh, and I could make a bigger impact about the future of Hawaii, which I think was important to me. I'd always uh, thought I need to be bigger than my excuses. I need to be stronger than my excuses. And so, but I would have to say I wasn't very successful. And one of the largest uh, reasons I look back on that I wasn't successful is because people were so firm in their positions that they wouldn't give a little bit to gain, you know, at least 80% of what they wanted. Now, wouldn't do that. And so our education system was suffering. Our higher education system was suffering. And therefore, our workforce was suffering. Yeah. And so uh, I always felt that, you know, that was one of the big problems. And then what can I do to overcome that? Well, that was a much... That was a Herculean task. <laughs> that was that needed the wisdom of Job, and I, I didn't. I didn't have that. What was? What do you? What do you think your biggest reason for lack of success? I'm not going to say failure, <laughs> but failure is not fatal. It no. doesn't have to be. Fatal. I mean, I do think that I'm a very persistent person, and uh, and I have a lot of patience. So. Uh, you know, I I think that, uh, like you, I mean, you know, it it's hard. Legislating is hard. You know, it's uh, convincing a majority of legislators in both houses to support your idea, and some people are just not going to do it. Um, but it is about being persistent, and it's about when your bill fails, it's asking the question what and why. Um, you know, trying to identify experts or people who can um, help you fix it or improve it in different ways. Uh, you know, and I was always proactive about 
uh, identifying stakeholders and making sure that, you know, if X, Y, Z was the reason the bill failed last year, that I would invite them to the conversation and try and understand what motivated them, you know, and what was the concern that they have and how would we be able to incorporate something that would make it um, reasonable to them. Um, and so, uh, you know, I obviously there were times that it didn't matter and, and I, I couldn't get a majority of people to agree. But um, I found that I was able, if I was willing to keep at it, that we could uh, make progress, right? It's not right. the perfect. It's not the perfect bill, right? But um, but it's it does move the system forward. Well, I always found when I hit a position like that, I always found that I would put my arm around the Republican leader and the Democrat leader, and I'd say, folks, if it had been easy to do, yeah. God would have sent somebody else. <laughs> That's why we're here. You know, when I found that there was resistance uh, to some particular, by a particular group uh, or legislators or whatever, uh, I would think, as I did in business, if I could make them uh, part of my solution, uh, but I had to make them a stakeholder. They had to, they had to see what was in it for their for their people in this country, uh, in this foreign country. Well, I saw the same thing in the state legislature. You know, uh, sure, maybe this was a, a uh, opportunity uh, and a bill that was really going to benefit Boise. And, but it may not, gonna, may not benefit uh, Sun Valley as well. So to bring the Boise guys in with the Sun Valley guys or gals, and uh, say, okay, how can we work this out so that you're both benefited by it? And so if they have ownership of uh, what the results are, and if they're players in it, and their people can see that they were working for them, then, then it works and it passes. Yeah, I mean, I do think that that's very important. And I, I think that that's what's missing in today's political environment it's yeah you know, I've always believed that it's about collaboration and and identifying all the stakeholders that are involved with an issue or problem uh, and inv inviting them to the table to participate right I mean it's it's um, you know the best way to collaborate is to get um, all stakeholders in a room you know and help them find a solution that is a win-win-win for everybody. And, you know, you can't do it all the time, but you can do it a lot of times. You know, like you said, the differences in, in, in Boi, Bo, Boise and some of the other communities are significant. But in almost most uh, every issue, you can find some common ground and some solution that would be uh, workable uh, and beneficial uh, to all the stakeholders involved. And, uh, and it really is about convening them and, and helping them recognize that it's, uh, it's a win for everybody and, uh, and asking them to support it. And there was always a common denominator. Yeah. And that there was somebody in each group which were seen to be resistant that were sort of the leaders, but they wanted something positive to happen. And so if you can get those two opposing poles uh, together and say, okay, you guys work it out. Tell me what you want to do and I'll help you. Right. And uh, so I, I found that uh, the, the ringleaders or the, 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 the people that seem to have uh, the most capability of success are the ones that you want to get together, sometimes put off in a room all by themselves and say, don't come out of that room until you got an answer for me. Yeah, and I think, you know, and a lot of times it's uh, to, in order to be successful, right, is to try and create that s space where both participants can trust you. They're safe. Yeah, it's a safe place to have a real 
real conversation about what the concerns are on either side uh, and really work toward a solution that, uh, that is win-win. You know, I, I, it's crazy today that compromise is a bad word uh, and working together with other people um, is really frowned upon. You know, it's, uh, you know, for most of my career, it's about getting things done and making things happen. And it's about being committed to uh, improving the community um, instead of having, you know, just a log jam that, that both sides lose um, because nothing happens. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes if somebody says, oh, we're not going to compromise on that, then we need to do the same thing the Founding Fathers did in the construction of our blueprints of freedom and say, all right, then let's seek consensus. It's still a C word, yeah. but it's not compromise. Because compromise always conjures up for people in their mind, they win, I lose. Consensus is, is better. And I use consensus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree, that's, that's uh, definitely a better word. So we, uh, we have to kind of set the tone uh, for the future. That's our job as has-beens. I'm no longer governor, you're no longer governor. So uh, how do we motivate, how do we inspire the next generation of Davids and Butches to get involved, to be frustrated about something, or to be a champion of a new idea that they really want to see happen? And I think the younger that you can get the youth involved, the better uh, off you are, and the better you will be in the future. And so uh, I make a lot of effort, uh, and made a lot of effort when I was governor, that if I got a request to come to a government class uh, in a high school, uh, or any school, I would go and I would talk about it, and then I would talk to them about getting involved. I said, you know, you can't just stand by and watch the parade go by. You got to get a float in the parade. Uh, if you want to make a difference and you see something missing, create your own float and get in the parade. But you, you've got to be involved. And there's a million ways to do it. And I'd give them some ideas about getting involved in the local party or working for a local candidate and seeing how things go. Uh, but that would be my idea, David, yeah. of how we inspire the next generation uh, to fulfill some of the things that we haven't. <laughs> I, I, when I talk with young people, and I, I was like you, Butch, you know, I would accept virtually any request I had to speak with students because they are the next generation. Uh, and many times I would talk with them about the fact that, you know, we're old, you know, we're talking about the Hawaii that you, young person, um, that you're going to live in, um, you know, and I, I certainly was committed um, to do everything I could as during my time as governor and during my time in um, public service uh, to create a better Hawaii that I could leave to my children because I felt my parents and that greatest generation really give gave the gift of opportunity to all of all of my colleagues in my generation um and so i just remind students that the future is more yours than mine's uh and you know there are so many examples of young people today making a difference you know technology has has changed so greatly that you know, having a voice and speaking out uh, in a constructive way, um, young people can make an impact. So I agree with you. It's, it's trying to encourage them to get them started. You know, I talk about Greta, Greta Thunberg and, you know, how she changed the whole conversation about climate change in a way that you or I could talk to her blue in our face and it would never have an impact. So I, I do try and remind students that um, and young people that it is about your future and 
the tools to make an impact are different today than they were in our generation. Uh, it's a lot of work. You know, I, I'm very honest with people about making change is hard, you know, and, and, and putting yourself out there and talking about what you're passionate about uh, is hard to do sometimes. But I challenge them to choose to make a difference. You know, things don't happen by accident. People have to want to leave a better future for their kids um, so that the community that they leave to their um, children is better than the one that we're leaving to ours. I mean, I think it is about that notion of, um, of being committed to, um, to the next generation having more opportunities than we had. <laughs>